Hey guys, Darren back again. Today we're taking a look at the Super Magic Drive SMD800. This is a device from the 90s that basically allows uh, you to, it sits on top of a Mega Drive, uh, Genesis, and you know, with a cartridge slot, and it basically allows you to dump the ROMs off the cartridge to a PC or a, a floppy drive or vice versa, it allows you to pull the ROM file off the PC or the disk to the device and ultimately onto your console. So it's kind of like a very primitive EverDrive. You know, its main purpose is to dump ROMs and pretty much all the ROMs that you find on the internet these days were pretty much done with devices like this back in the day. Someone sat there and went through game by game and just dumped them all. So what we're doing today is we're gonna we're going to open this up, take a look, and ultimately try and get it working. Now, I actually don't have the floppy drive that goes with it. So if you look at the back here, the two ports are disk I.O., disk input output, and COM, you know, communications or computer I.O. These are both parallel ports. Uh, you, you know, the young kids playing at home probably haven't seen or heard of parallel ports, but it's what we used to use in the old days to communicate with PCs parallel ports and also serial ports, which are a bit smaller. So this is a basic parallel port. What I'm hoping is that we can just connect our PC up with a parallel port and some software, talk to the COM port and just read and write the ROMs that way without the need for a floppy drive altogether. I think you can do it with this model. So let's uh, let's give it a go. Now I haven't, um, I haven't opened this up. I haven't turned it on. So I kind of want to just have a look before I turn it on and we'll go from there. So let's flip it over. Looks like four screws. So I want to pull this apart and we'll come back and we'll see if we can get it going. So the screws are out. I've tapped them out and we've got, got four screws and we've got a bit of dirt that came out. Let's see if we can pop the lid. Yep, that comes off really easily. Not much going on there. Wow, look at the board, okay. Ooh, right. Can you see, can you see that? That's the battery which is corroding. So we'll come back to that. Uh, and that's why I like to have a look at things like this before I power them on because that could be a problem. We've got a ROM chip here which we can program. Oh, there's actually two ROMs under there. Huh. We might be able to lift this off. Let's have a look. Does that come off? Yeah, it does. Let's gently prise this up. SMD 94V-0. That's kind of cool. Yeah, so there's actually two ROMs there. That'll be the BIOS that's programmable with the EEPROM. And that'll just be uh, a mask ROM or something. Look, I'm not gonna to dig too far into this. All I'm gonna do is try and get it working because we really could be barking up a too difficult pathway here. So, you know, a couple of caps also we could look at. One, two, three, four. We probably really should replace them. But before we do any of that, um, let's, take, let's take the board out. Okay. So SMD 94V-0, maybe 1994, I don't know. Look at all these little traces here. Has someone done that? I don't know. Or is that factory? I'm not sure. The underside looks like it's in pretty good condition actually. So I'm concerned with this battery though. So let's, let's order a new battery and get that replaced. Um, 3.6 volt, 60 milliamp hour, NICAD. Yeah, so it's old school NICAD. I'm gonna have to order a few parts actually. So I'm, I'm gonna order a replacement battery straight away before I even power this on. I'm gonna order a parallel cable. Um, it's gonna be, this is female and a PC end is female. So it's gonna be male to male, just a straight through 25 pin uh, LPT cable. And obviously a parallel port PCI adapter because you know modern PCs don't have parallels so I'll have to get a 
PCI Express adapter or dig up an old PC, which I actually do have in the garage. Um, software is gonna be a problem. I'll have to look into some software. And uh, yeah, that's probably all we need. So I'll order those parts and we'll get, I'll cut this video together so you, you don't even know. So let me, um, let me desolder this battery, get this right out of the way. And then we'll just inspect it to make sure there's no damage. Hit up our little TS100 with the uh, cable mod we did in a previous video. Let's get some solder. Let's get some wick. Okay, so I've got that pretty much done. Let me just zoom you in on that. Yeah, okay, so we're nice and loose. Right. So that came out pretty effortlessly. We didn't break anything. Now what's the polarity? Just So I think that polarity goes down and does, there's the plus. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Now what we need to do is clean it up. Just isopropyl and a toothbrush or, you know, just some, just a nylon brush like this one. Um, okay, so there's a bit of damage on that top side, but that's okay because there's no traces. The traces will be here, like this is to be ground plane. So that's okay. Let's clean that up. And that one obviously just goes up to there. So that's fine. We could always, yeah, it goes to that resistor. These are a bit, these resistors actually are a bit crusty as well. You can see the green corrosion on those legs. So, you know what, let's just, uh, let's probably go right over the board and just make sure there's no corrosion. Just give it an absolute soaking and just clean up parts like that. Yeah, that's unusual. What's going on with that one there? I don't know what that big stain is actually. Is that is that a leaked capacitor? It doesn't look like it. It's very odd. They're not electrolytic, so I don't know, you know, there's plenty of them around. I don't know what that stain is. I'm not sure, but I'm not gonna worry about that too much. Let's just give this a boot and we'll see what happens. Okay, so with the magic of television, I've ordered the parts. So we've got um, some batteries. We've got just two in the pack here. These arrived just the other day. Let's open that up. And I'm fairly sure that's the same. Yep. So we'll go ahead and put that in. That'll sit with the positive side down. It'll go that way. Uh, now we've got ourselves a parallel port uh, PCI Express card. So there's your parallel port, you know, the standard rear PC header, uh, a couple of chips to make it run, and just your very basic PCI Express slot. Uh, I've got a good brand. I found this one secondhand in the UK, actually, and just shipped it over, StarTech.com. The reason I picked this one is because I know it has Windows 10 drivers. So I'm going to attempt to get all this running on Windows 10. It's probably a bit silly. I probably should use XP. That's the generation of this stuff. But I'll give this a go. Um, Windows may detect it, but if not, I know there's drivers to make that work, so that's why I picked that. Um, and of course a parallel cable, so it's just, uh, well, that's a bit squashed that end, but we'll fix that. Mail on both ends, just a standard um, parallel cable. So, go ahead and open that up. Yeah, that must have got crushed in transit. That's okay. I'm not going to worry about that too much. Just bend that casing back. There you go. It's as good as new. So that should 
plug into there, which it does. Right, so that's our parallel end. This end will go into the back of the unit, like that. Uh, and that's our, that's the theory. So I'll go ahead and install this sort of stuff. You don't really need to see me put this inside a computer. It's just open the case, power it down, plug it in, power it back up, okay? So that's all that is. And if that doesn't work and I can't get this working on Windows 10, I'm gonna dig up an old XP ancient computer I actually do have in the shed, uh, which has a built-in serial and parallel port on the, on the motherboard. So that'll be our backup and we can just chuck the software on that PC instead if we need to. But hopefully this works for Windows 10. So just double check I've got the correct polarity, which I do. Huge ground plane. Okay, so that's all plugged in. I've got it mounted in the top of the Mega Drive. I've got this manually switched to Japanese. Um, so it's in uh, Japanese mode, just to make it maybe more compatible, but we'll try it. Uh, USA and PAL as well. So batteries in, I put the daughter board back in, parallels all connected. Uh, so let's give it a go. And if you, okay, so we got, it works. Let me just pan you over to the screen. My screen here's on the side. This is a screen I use for reading documents these days, but I also use it for testing things like this. So that's why it's on the side. Okay, so Magic Driver version one, interesting. RAM, eight meg, no drive detected. Yeah, okay. C to, so B to boot disk, run IC card, cool. All right, well, I better plug a controller in and see what happens. Okay, so it's the next day and I literally played around with that uh, Windows 10 installation and the LPT port for a couple of hours and the card works fine in Windows 10, no problem. But unfortunately, the software that we need to run to actually, you know, talk to this unit just crashes in Windows 10. It's just not compatible. So then I tried a Windows XP virtual machine, which kind of works, but I just couldn't get it to work properly. So to cut a long story short, I gave up on that. And I've pulled out the old uh, POS HP Pavilion crappy PC from the garage, which runs XP and has a parallel port built into the motherboard. So that all that all is booted up and the software runs and we've plugged it all in. And good news is this actually does work. So I'm gonna show you that in a second. Um, and then I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do next. So basically um, this operates in, um, you know, 60 Hertz, uh, Japanese or English, it doesn't matter. So I've just got it set to US mode at the moment. Um, parallels all connected. It's connected to the back of the PC. And then we're gonna cut across to the screen of the dodgy PC and I'll launch the software, which is called RBD Util, ROM Backup Device Utility, and it's version 2.0. That's the latest one out there and it actually does work quite well. But you need to run it on XP and just make sure your LPT1 is set up correctly. It's got an IRQ and it's set to bi-directional parallel mode, if you know what all that means. It's very old school stuff, this, but it all it all seems to work fine. Um, but what's what we're gonna try and do is go back to the software, try and load a ROM into it, and then we're gonna try and dump the ROM out of the cartridge. And of course, we're gonna modify, you know, this is version 1.0 BIOS, so, Luckily on the internet, there's, um, you know, all the BIOS versions are out there. So I've, I'll go through that as well. I'll quickly download it and we'll flash that to a new EEPROM, which I've got here, M27C128A. We'll flash that with the latest, uh, you know, version three BIOS and we'll see how that works as well. But right now, at least this is sort of working. So without any further rambling, let me cut you across to the dodgy PC. The quality will drop a little bit um, and we'll go from there. 
Okay, so we're over on the dodgy PC and I've launched the tool. We're on backup device utility version two. So you need to go and just select your device, Super Magic Driver, make sure your parallel ports are correct. Make sure that, you know, the LPT1 was correct. Then here's the game. So that, and you need to look at the size of the games. It's 512K, 1024, and 204.8. So 1024K is the largest file we can load. So let's start off with Afterburner 2. Just load the file, click play, and if everything's correct, that'll just start loading the file uh, via the parallel cable to the RAM on the device. So I've just brought in a shot here of my screen, and you can see the software counts up as it loads the ROM. And here we go. So that all seems to work pretty well. So let's try another one. Let's try Castlevania. So just open and grab the ROM file and load. Now you'll notice um, down the bottom left there, it says 8192. So the amount of RAM we've got is eight, uh, eight, uh, 8,192 kilobits. So we need to divide 8192 by eight to get to kilobytes, which is 1024. And that's the maximum size ROM we can load, 1024K. So you sort of hope you understand how that works. So we can load most ROMs, but not all, because a lot of the Mega Drive Genesis ROMs went over one meg. So let's do one more, let's do Truxton, which is a pretty small file actually. This will, this will load really fast. I won't actually show you the loading, so I'll just get into it. In the research for this video, you know, I had to had to find the BIOS files. I had to find information on this old device, and luckily, there's a lot of information out there. So the Sega Retro site is really good. They pretty much have everything listed, uh, including the BIOS files to download, which is where I got them from. And you know, there's actually quite a lot of information out there. Uh, it talks about the different revisions and how the 16 megabit can be upgraded to 24 megabit, which is pretty cool. Uh, I don't know if my 8 megabit version can be upgraded. I, it probably can with the right chips, but I don't really know how to do that. Um, so I'm just going to leave it for now. The BIOSes are interesting. So version 4.1 is only for the very last revision. Uh, and at this point in time when I was making this, I didn't realize but but the, all of version three kind of versions, they're also for a later versions. They actually don't work on the one I've got. But I went through the exercise of downloading them and flashing them to a BIOS file, and I tried them out. So that's the process there. I'm not going to really show you that in detail because it ultimately didn't work. But it's pretty basic to do. There's no problem at all. With the BIOSes, I really couldn't get um, anything newer than 1.0 to work. So I flashed all the versions I could get my hands on. Where There's actually quite a few. There's 3, 3.1G, 3.1C, 4.1, 3.0. I tried them all. They didn't work. Um, I think they're designed for later revisions, the, uh, the revisions with more memory. So, you know, 
just going back to the basics, this is the eight meg version, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are the RAM chips. The later models have different board on top and more RAM, um, different types of chips. So I think those BIOSes are for that later models. So the very last thing I did was flash the original BIOS back to one of my chips just to make sure my burning technique and everything was okay. And that's fine. So that boots as it, as it did originally. I think we're pretty much done now. So I'll go ahead and put this back together. I'll put the lid back on and I'll probably end up selling this on. I don't really want to keep this. Um, it's sort of the poor man's Everdrive, if you know what I mean. We've got um, ROM supports. So you can basically look, grab your ROM, throw it on the device, and you can play it on real hardware. So that functionality works perfectly. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, the original use case of dumping uh, the ROM off a cartridge, that doesn't seem to work for me. I can't get that to work. So you know what, who cares anyway? We've got all the ROMs, we don't need that. Uh, it's just the upload functionality that I'm glad works. So I'll go ahead and pack this up and I'll give you my final thoughts. So is this thing for everyone? No, probably not. But you know what, if you've got one or you find one cheap enough, it basically runs as, a, as an EverDrive. <laughs> you know, I'm using that term very liberally. Practically, could you use this? Well, you could get yourself an old PC running Windows XP. If it doesn't have a parallel port, you could just put a PCI one in there. There's no problem. You could put that next to your TV in the corner and you could just load ROMs off it uh, and throw them on this. You could dual boot the PC to Windows 10 and run that as a media center so you can watch your videos and things uh, on your TV as well. So one PC could definitely do both jobs. Uh, you just reboot it into XP to, to use this and then back to Windows 10 for your normal activities and even emulation if you wanted to. So that's how I would do it practically. I hope you found that interesting. I kind of did actually, I enjoyed this one. Um, I enjoyed finding a piece of old retro hardware and getting it working again. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.